Thanks. So uh, I would like to try to finish this chapter off today, the one about the problem of evil and suffering. And then after that, there's a, have you guys been reading this book actually? I've been taking philosophy class. But have you read the book? Uh, I've used it to answer. Read, some read the book. It's very, especially it, after this chapter, there's this little interlude. Uh, and I, I don't know if you read the first part of it, but it's called A Philosopher's Journey to Faith. But it's, it's William Lane Craig's kind of own story. And so it's very encouraging to read it. So uh, it's a couple pages here. And then there's, a, there's part one earlier in the book. So if you haven't read it... Uh, so was he first an atheist before he came to Christ? Or? He was raised in kind of a nominally Christian home, but uh -huh. wasn't saved. And uh, again, he thought a lot about why am I here? What is the point of all this? That sort of stuff. And uh, he sat behind this girl in German class that was always like really happy. And, and, and it kind of got on his nerves. <laughs> and one day he was like, what's your deal? Like, why are you so happy all the time? She's like, because I know Jesus as my savior. And so she witnessed to him and he started hanging out with them a little bit. And then, so he like read the gospel of John and like for, I think he said like a month or so, just like walled this over in his head. And so finally he was, he realized that the God of the universe knows him and cares about him. And so he accepted Christ as the savior. But the, the second part of this, he, well, even during that, he talks about how, uh, he went to college and met his wife and then he just like she said like if you could do anything you wanted to and money was no object what would you do and so he said well I'd really like to go get a doctorate in philosophy from this school with this professor and how like the Lord made it work out and then they went to uh, they were living in France and so that he and his wife both learned to speak French fluently and uh, then uh, their time in France was over and they kind of were out of money, but he applied to this other, because she was like, she went to him again. So like, if there's anything, like if the money was no object, what would you want to do? He's like, well, I'd really like to get a doctorate in theology from the University, <laughs> the University of Munich under Wolfhard Pannenberg. And so like he applied for this, uh, like it's a, like a scholarship thing, like a, a position where it's all paid for and everything like that. And, and they actually were ready to leave France. They, they, I don't know if they shipped their stuff home or whatever, but then he got this scholarship. And like the whole story, is, it's very encouraging because it's kind of like, you know, obviously the Lord was involved in all this stuff. So read that if, if you are so inclined to. I, I would encourage it because especially uh, knowing that God cares about us and cares about what's happening in our lives it's good to hear, like, that's why it's good to read, like, autobiographies and stuff like that, to see that, like, God really does work in the lives of individual people. And, and that kind of ties in with some of the stuff with the suffering that we talked about last time we had class. Like, we don't know how all this fits together. You know, it, from our point of view, you might say, like, why would the Lord let this happen? to me or why like even little things like I think about this often when I'm driving somewhere and you know I take a wrong turn or like I somebody cuts me off and I miss an exit and I get frustrated because I'm late but like what if I actually made the turn when I was supposed to and got on the highway and if I did that then I would have been killed in a car accident I don't know that stuff so it's almost like calming to think okay that happened I was not surprised to God. Let it go. <laughs> like last night, Noah and I were working. My lawn, like the mower deck lifter thing on my tractor broke off. So we're trying to get this piece on last night. And it's, it was immensely frustrating. And I still didn't get it because you have to put this bolt in for the back and there's no room to get your fingers and stuff. And it's like, sometimes you're like, why does this have to happen? <laughs> like, this is so annoying. Like, I don't have time to do this right now. I'm not in a position to know that. So maybe there's some reason for it or not, maybe just to teach me patience or something. So uh, it's encouraging. Then the point I was going to get at is after this chapter, then we get into who was Jesus. So as we've been talking, uh, I think I talked about this the last class, everything so far has just been kind of generically theistic. 
we're, we're making the case that God does exist. So if God does, if, if a God that created everything else exists, we've just narrowed all the world religions down to three. So there's three live options, Judaism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So then the question is, which one is the correct one? So the next chapter is all about who was Jesus? Because again, that's really the determining factor. And then chapter nine is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if uh, you want to validate the claims that Jesus made, it really all rests on whether or not he rose from the dead. So that's, I believe, the last chapter in the book. So we really have, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The, the 10th chapter is Christian particularism. Is Jesus the only way to God? Right, so we're getting, it seems like we're halfway through the book, but there's only three chapters up. All right, so we were talking about this problem of suffering. I wanna show you this clip before we get rolling. This was a debate with, uh, I think this is, uh, Blank on the guy's name. What do you think about that? Uh, he was debating Christopher Hitchens is uh, now no longer an atheist, unfortunately for him. So he's dead. Right, so, my knowledge, I don't think he had a deathbed conversion. So. Epicurus's argument that if God is omnibelevant, omniscient, and omnipotent, if he knows about kids in Africa and he, uh, like that are born with like AIDS, um, what, what do you think about him suggesting, like him not intervening and him not changing that fact? Like, I don't, I, did I show this yet? No. no. That's a question that I've always uh, struggled with. So I'm just wondering, yeah. uh, like, could you expand on that? And also like, you're yeah. on it. The problem of evil and suffering has been greatly discussed by philosophers. And I think there's been genuine progress made uh, in this century on this problem. I think it's important to distinguish between the intellectual problem of suffering and the emotional problem of suffering, uh, because these are quite different from each other. In terms of the intellectual problem of suffering, I think that there you need to ask yourself, is the atheist claiming, as Epicurus did, that the existence of God is logically incompatible with the evil and suffering in the world? If that's what the atheist is claiming, that he's got to be presupposing some kind of hidden assumptions that would bring out that contradiction and make it explicit because these statements are not explicitly contradictory. The problem is no philosopher in the history of the world has ever been able to identify what those hidden assumptions would be that would bring out the contradiction and make it explicit. On the contrary, you can actually prove that these are logically compatible with each other by adding a third proposition, namely that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil in the world. As long as that statement is even possibly true, it proves that there's no logical incompatibility between God and the suffering in the world. So the atheist would have to show that it is logically impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, and no atheist has ever been able to do that. So the, the logical version of this problem, I think, is widely recognized to have failed. Those atheists who still press the problem, therefore press it as a probabilistic argument. They try to say that given the evil in the world, it's improbable that God exists. Not impossible, but improbable. Well, again, the difficulty there is that the atheist has to claim that if God did exist, then it is improbable that he would permit the evil and suffering in the world. And how could the atheist possibly know that? How could the atheist know that uh, God would not, if he existed, permit the evil and suffering in the world. Maybe he's got good reasons for it. Uh, maybe, like in Christian theism, God's purpose for human history is to bring the maximum number of people freely into his kingdom to find salvation and eternal life. And how do we know that that wouldn't require a world that is simply suffused with natural and moral suffering? It might be that only in a world like that, the maximal number of people would freely come to know God and find salvation. So the atheist would have to show that there is a possible world that's feasible for God, which God could have created that would have just as much salvation and eternal life 
and knowledge of God is the actual world, but with less suffering. And how could the atheist prove such a thing? It's sheer speculation. So the problem is that as an argument, the problem of evil it makes probability judgments which are very, very ambitious and which we are simply not in a position to make with any kind of confidence. Now, I recognize that that philosophical response to the question doesn't deal with the emotional problem of evil. And I think for most people, this isn't really a philosophical problem. It's an emotional problem. They just don't like a God who would permit suffering uh, and, and, and uh, pain in the world. And so they turn their backs on him. What does Christianity have to say to this problem? Well, I think it has a lot to say. It tells us that God is not some sort of an impersonal ground of being or an indifferent tyrant who folds his arms and watch, watches the world suffer. Rather, he is a God who enters into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He suffers. On the cross, Christ bore a suffering of which we can form no conception, even though he was innocent. He bore the penalty of the sins of the whole world. None of us can comprehend what he suffered. And I think when we contemplate the cross of Christ and his love for us and what he was willing to undergo for us, it puts the problem of suffering in an entirely different perspective. It means, I think, that we can bear the suffering that God calls upon us to endure in this life with courage and with optimism for an eternal life of unending joy beyond the grave because of what Christ has done for us. And he will give us, I think, the courage and the, the strength to get through the suffering that God calls upon us to bear in this life. So whether it's an emotional issue or an intellectual issue, I think ultimately um, Christian theism can make sense out of the, the suffering and evil in the world. All right. Let me show you, I want to show you one more and just talk. I went through eight years of Catholic school, right. uh, Sisters of Charity, and I uh, got Stop. A professional religious education throughout all those eight years. I just really want to share the story. <laughs> so th this is, we've talked about the logical problem. This is the, the I don't think, have we watched this? I don't think I showed you this. No. So this is the probability part. So what, what are the odds that God would let this amount of suffering uh, and evil exist in the world? And so, the problem of suffering and evil, this argument attempts to show that since suffering and evil exist, it is logically impossible for God to exist. And we explain why even atheist philosophers admit that this argument fails. But wait! It may still be argued that while it's logically possible that God and suffering both exist, it's far from likely. There's just so much pointless suffering, it seems improbable that God could have good reasons for permitting it. This is the probability version of the problem. Suffering provides empirical evidence that God's existence is not impossible, just highly unlikely. Is this a good argument? Consider three points. First, we are not in a position to say with any confidence that God probably lacks reasons for allowing the suffering in the world. The problem is that we are limited in space and time and in intelligence and insight. God, on the other hand, sees every detail of history from beginning to end and orders it through people's free decisions and actions. In order to achieve his purposes, God may have to allow a great deal of suffering along the way. Suffering which appears pointless within our limited scope of understanding may be seen to have been justly permitted by God within his wider framework. Sometimes what we experience makes no sense until we gain a wider perspective and see the big picture designed by the Creator. Here's the second point. Relative to the full scope of the evidence, God's existence may well be probable. You see, probabilities are always relative to background information. 
For example, if we consider only how much this man weighs, we would say it's highly improbable that he's a world-class athlete. But when we're willing to consider new information that he's a professional sumo wrestler and a world champion, we quickly revise our theme. In the same way, when the atheist claims that God's existence is improbable, we should ask, improbable relative to what background information? If we consider only the suffering in the world, then God's existence may very well appear to be improbable. But if we're willing to look at the full scope of background information to take into account the powerful arguments for God's existence, we will come to a very different conclusion. The third point is, Christianity entails doctrines that increase the probability of the coexistence of God and suffering. Consider four of these. First, the chief purpose of life is not happiness. People often assume that if God exists, his role is to create a comfortable environment for his human pets. They think the ultimate goal of our lives on earth is happiness, and therefore, God is obligated to keep us happy. However, Christianity presents a radically different view that the purpose of life is to know God. This alone brings true, lasting fulfillment. Suffering can bring about a deeper, more intimate knowledge of God, either on the part of the one who is suffering or those around him. The whole point of human history is that God, having given us free will, is drawing as many people as he can into his unending kingdom. Suffering is one of the ways God can draw people freely to himself. In fact, countries that have endured the most hardship often show the highest growth rates for Christianity. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Second, mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. Terrible human evils are testimony to man's depravity, a consequence of his alienation from God. The Christian isn't surprised at moral evil in the world. On the contrary, he expects it. The third doctrine states that God's purpose is not restricted to this life, but spills over beyond the grave into eternal life. This world is just the beginning, the entryway to an unimaginable, never-ending life beyond death's door. Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, underwent afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, hunger. Yet he wrote, we do not lose heart, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, because we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul understood that life on earth and whatever suffering it holds for each of us is temporary. Our pain will not endure forever, but our lives with God will. Paul was not belittling the plight of those who suffer horribly in this life. Indeed, he was one of them. But he saw that those sufferings will be overwhelmed forever by the ocean of joy that God will give to those who will freely receive it. And the fourth doctrine is this. The knowledge of God is an incomparable good. Knowing God is the ultimate fulfillment of human existence, an infinite good. Thus, the person who knows God, no matter how much he has suffered, can still say, God is good to me. So, if Christianity is true, it's not at all improbable that suffering and evil should exist. In summary, for all these reasons, the probability version of the problem of evil is no more successful than the logical version. As a purely intellectual problem, then, the problem of evil does not disprove God's existence. But even if those intellectual arguments fail, the emotional problem of suffering and evil remains very powerful. 
If you have suffered deeply, or if you've watched someone you love go through intense pain, you may be thinking, so what if God exists? Why would I want to respond to him or worship him? I feel cold and empty. I want nothing to do with him. You're not alone. God knows your name. He knows who you are and what you're going through. God promises to be with you through your suffering. He can give you the strength to endure. Jesus Christ also suffered. Although he was innocent, he was tortured and sentenced to death. His suffering had a purpose to provide you and me with a life-giving connection to God. Not only does God exist, but he loves you. He seeks after you. He offers you hope. And in time, you will make all things new. You will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death for mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. All right, so what do you think? Why, why do you think that, let's talk about this a little bit. Why would suffering bring people to God as opposed to not having suffering? Uh, let me, before we say that, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so even if you look back, like if you look at the history, because again, it says that the, all these things were written, like the Old Testament story of Israel and what happened to them was written for us. So when you look at even before uh, all that stuff happened, when God talked to Abraham, he told them what was going to happen, right? And he told Moses what was going to happen, that they would go into the land of plenty from slavery and then what would happen? They get the law. They say, we will, like Moses presents it to them. And they say, yes, we will do these things. And we agree. And we want God to be our God and all that stuff. What happens to them? They walk away. Yeah, they turn away. When things go well, they turn away. Is that an isolated case? Can we see that again in history? What country could you think of that was founded by people who wanted to find a place where they could freely worship God and they wanted to build a society that would allow them to, to live in a biblical way. And then that country was blessed more than any other country in the history of the world with prosperity. And then uh, the country turns its back to God. Can you think of any place like that? America. America. <laughs> I'm literally sitting in it. So isn't that isn't that interesting that that that's the way things happen? Because what's what's the mindset that people get when things go well? That we don't need God. We don't need God. That God didn't God didn't do all this and give me this. I did. Or or this country like made it possible and and uh we could, we could do it again if we started over. We could do it without just like eliminate God and we could run the whole thing again. It would all work out the same. That's kind of the mentality that people have. And, and, I, and I, I was talking to uh, Scott Van Duzer. Well, he, well, he, he said this upstairs, like we were downstairs. He was, there was a message he was talking about. The most dangerous place you can be is a place where you think that you don't need God. And I was listening to a message the other day, and they said, the, and this kind of stuck with me. He said, the most important thing about you is what you think about God. Small that one over for a while. That's true, isn't it? The most important thing about you is what you think about God. Because that's the thing that will matter eternally. Whether you accept God, whether you reject God, whether you see God as loving you and and caring for you or you think that he doesn't exist or he's uh 
not worthy of being worshipped and all that sort of stuff. So why? So then, why? If that's the case, why does suffering draw us back to God? Desperation. Okay. Because, like, why are we desperate? You realize you need help again. Yeah, you, you realize you realize that you can't do it on your own. Right there, there. I mean, think about how often we think that we are in control and we we got it all covered and then something out of left field comes in that's like we're not in control of that and you really realize how little you actually can control i mean think about how much how many how many things happen to us every day that are outside of our control most things right so we have to rely on him but another thing i was thinking about is So he created Adam and Eve and gave them free will. And they disobeyed him. And he knew that that was going to happen. And we often talk about how God knew not only that that was going to happen, but obviously if he's omniscient, he knows everything. So he knew that he would buy us back. And he knew that like the, he would send the son and the son would suffer. And all like the whole story, like God knows it. If he's omniscient, he knows everything, which is, again, hard to kind of grasp because he doesn't think about it. He just knows it, like simple knowledge. He just knows it. Like it, you ever see the, I wouldn't recommend these movies, but there was a movie back in like the nineties, Jim Carrey, and he becomes God for a week. It's like Bruce Almighty or Evan Almighty. Oh uh, yeah. Like one of those. Two things. Bruce but it was silly because he gets overwhelmed by all the prayers of the people in the world. Right. But again, God already know. like God knows that all, oh, it's not like in real time he's like oh okay like you know like that's what i mean omniscience is hard to think about because he just knows everything he turned like for eternity it's not like he has to like okay if i do this then this is going to happen so that it's like not like chess where you're trying to think moves ahead like god already knows everything so he knew that and he creates adam and eve and Adam and Eve knew God in a way that we don't know God because they had that sinless state and full communion with God. In, in a, I'm saying this in a sense. But think about this. Because of, because of their sin and, and because of the way that we see God act through history, we know God. And that's kind of what I was thinking about this morning, if you were there this morning, like, how every and I, I should qualify that because we do know things about God through the Holy Spirit, but that's only made possible because of the Son, because the Spirit couldn't dwell in us if we weren't redeemed by the Son. So it makes sense. I don't get too deep theologically or anything, but right. So the Spirit teaches us things and brings things to our remembrance. But even everything that we see in the Word of God it was inspired by the Spirit, the people who were uh, dwelt with the Spirit, but. A lot of it's based on the words of the sun and, and everything that we talked about in terms of all these arguments for the existence of God are natural theological arguments, but the sun is the one who made creation. They had all went through him. So the, the point that I'm making is that because of sin and suffering and, and the problems that we have in life, we're able to know things about God that weren't accessible to Adam and Eve before sin. You ever think about that? Like, did they understand, and I don't have to say that we understand it, but did, did they know God as being merciful or gracious or long-suffering or patient? Did they know that? Did they know the extent of God's love? Because again, like we read this morning, we know love because and sent his son to be a propitiation for us, right? So again, like you could say that they knew that God was loving, but they didn't know the extent to which God loves us like we do. And then you read something like like John 17. Have you ever really like ever just read John 17 and thought about it? where it's, you know, Jesus is talking, this is right the night before the cross, and he says uh, that, um, right, verse 
so it's fine. I don't have my regular Bible with me, but in verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Like that, that is a mind blowing verse, isn't it? That God loves us to the same level and degree that he loves his son. Which I always think like that, I, I can understand how the father loves the son because the son is God. And he always does the things that are pleasing to the father. You know, do you always do the things that are pleasing to God? Because I don't. So how, like, how can he love me? Because I'm not, I'm not, like, we're trying to be more like Christ as we're saved. We're hopefully becoming more like Christ, but I'm not a lot like Christ in many ways, right? But he still loves me the same as that, which is hard to grasp. And, and it's through the times of suffering that oftentimes you see that. And it's, it's interesting when you look at even like persecution, how it, it actually leads people to reach out to God. Because uh, one of the things that you think about, the whole idea of salvation, there's a couple components of it, right? First of all, you have to realize that you need to be saved, right? I, I always think of like, and someone said this one time, and I, I was thinking about it, like Michael Phelps, everybody knows who Michael Phelps is, yeah. like the greatest Olympian swimmer in history. So Michael Phelps swimming in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And you, you roll up to Michael Phelps in the boat, and you're like, hey, Michael, get in the boat, man, I'll save you. And you're like, Michael's like, no, I'm Michael Phelps. I'm the best swimmer there's ever been. You're like, okay, Mike, but you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Like you so, can't swim to shore. I got this, buddy. Like if I get tired of the freestyle, then I'll breaststroke. And I'm like I have gold medals in all of these things. I got it. I'm good to go. Do I look like I'm struggling now? No, but you can't swim to shore. Like there's no way. And it's, you know what I'm saying? So before you get, before you can accept the offer of salvation, you have to know that you need to be saved. And then you have to know that there's someone that can save you. And then you have to accept that salvation right so there's like these different parts of it and i think again suffering from the christian point of view makes sense of that because what that's after you swim for a couple days and you're dehydrated and you're hungry and you realize like even though i'm michael phelps i'm going to drown then you're like i need someone to save me and you wouldn't know that if everything's going swimming Think about that. That was a plan. Yeah. Mike, yeah. I should drop the mic on that. Like, uh, but you know what I'm saying. And then you have to. Then you have to. So then, even if you realize there's someone that you can save me, if they come up beside you and say, "Get in the boat," you're like, "No, nope. I won't accept your offer." Which seems silly, but that's people do that stuff. <coughs> so, so there's that aspect of of this whole situation. Uh, thoughts. You guys have any thoughts? I could say more, but I want to hear what you guys think about this. So on the, the whole, let's open it up to the whole chapter. What do you guys think? I think it like we're talking about this whole logical problem and the emotional side of things too, but I think when people are suffering, they tend to blame Grant blame God, which is the emotional problem of it, but I think it's a lot harder than just, like, explaining to them how it's, how it makes sense, like, it's something that they have to work through themselves, and I think it's something we just can't explain away, like, they have to work through it themselves, and the Holy Spirit has to work in them, which I think is the difficult part, because at least I want to, like, go up, talk to someone, and fix all their problems, like, I don't want to have to let them do it, but I think it's something we just have to let the Holy Spirit work. What happens if you take God out of the picture? We talked about this before. Yeah, that's like back to the first couple chapters we were talking about how if 
God doesn't exist, then all of life is meaningless, valid, purposeless, and valueless. Right. So, I mean, think about it. If there is no God, then there's no one who's directing all of these things. Mm -hmm. They're just happening. So there really is no one to blame. And this life is all that there is. So as as much as things might not be fair or disappointing, there, there's no time or place where things are going to be made right. Mm -hmm. It will never be correct. You see what I'm saying? So again, there's two different pieces in that. So with God, A, a we have someone who's able to control and, and do things. So we, we know that. And I think, too, you have to tease some things out in the Bible. Like, I believe that there are two aspects to the will of God. I think that there's the directive will of God, where God actively makes things happen. And then there's the permissive will of God, where God lets things happen, even though that's really not what he wants to happen. He lets it happen because of free will. And so a lot of the gratuitous evil that you see in the world, I think God, he, like, you can't say that God made, uh, they had Amon Gurth on, on there, you know who he is? You ever hear the movie Schindler's List? Oh, yeah. He was the commandant of the oh. camp, I mean, he was a bad, bad guy. Right. So I, you know, I think God allowed that guy to do what he did, but I don't think we could say that God made him do that. Right. So I think it's God, he permitted it to happen, but he permitted it to happen within the larger scope of his directive will, which was that there's again, a reason for it. But if you take God out of the picture, what do you have left? Nothing. You just have meaningless suffering. And the, the interesting thing is all the people who argue against this, go back to what we said before, like he, I, even even like Christopher Hitchens, who was there, he, he always moralized about things and said that this is wrong and this is right, or we need to be working to make society better. Is that the guy who always argues that we should, like, we're... We have a good, um, we have like good, you were born with good morals and we should be doing things for the betterment of society. And I think, well, he, he said things like that, but, but again, what's the problem with that? Like, again, if you don't have God, you don't have, there's no such thing as objective moral values and duties. So we, there is really no such thing as evil. If you take evil completely out of the picture, if there is no evil, it's not that people won't think they need God. It's that literally there wouldn't be a need for God to begin with because if we're perfect, then we don't sin anyways, right? There is no evil in the world. Right. So it there wouldn't even has exist. to be evil to a certain point, right? Because say say I, it again. Somewhere I, I, I lost. Because... Here. So if we, if you completely eliminate evil, right, there's no evil, uh -huh. then there is God, right? Well, it's, it's not that people wouldn't think they need God, right? There wouldn't be a need for God well, at but, that point. Well, remember, there, if there is no God, there is no evil. So you yeah. couldn't eliminate you couldn't eliminate that, evil. That's and, why the whole argument falls apart. Yeah, you're coming at it the other way, but it's the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you can't eliminate evil and still have God because God is good. Mm -hmm. And evil is the lack of goodness, right? It's a privation of the good. That's the classical theological definition of evil, the lack of good. So like again you're smuggling in the standard where you get the standard from. And that, and that, I think, like, let me ask you guys, why, why do you think, why do you think even when we go back to the problem of like moral things, why is it so difficult to, to kind of explain this to people who don't believe in God? What do you think? Can you say that again? Why, so when you talk about evil and suffering, and pain and suffering and stuff like that. And 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 kind of what you were saying, like how could God let this happen type of thing? How why is that such a hard thing to explain to people when you're talking about the idea of good and evil and moral standard and all that stuff? Like, you know, you you're trying to say, like, well, you, 
you're going to make society better, better compared to what? Or, you know, this is how you should behave. Well, who says should according to who? You know, all those types of things. Why, why do you think that's so hard to explain this to people, that there has to be, if there's objective morality, there has to be God? I don't know if I'm explaining my question. Good enough. They don't fully understand where to get their standard from and i feel like they're looking just looking for reasons to kind of find a hole in your argument why god doesn't exist because they don't want to be uh held accountable that's yeah i think that's true but what i was going for is because we all have a moral sense in us like you know what i mean because like, like the people will be like why do i have to appeal to god like i know what's good and bad i know that this is wrong you know i don't need god to tell me that this is good and, like that i shouldn't be a rapist or I shouldn't mass murder people. Like, like even if there wasn't a guy, do you think everybody would just go out and start randomly killing people? Of course not. That's silly, right? And that's what they say, right? And it's true. But it's only true because God has built us as moral creatures. We have a moral law within. That's what it says in Romans 2. Like, even the people who don't know the law have the law within. So they think that they don't need God because obviously, like, I, like, obviously, like, if I don't believe in God, it's not going to all of a sudden I'm going to become unhinged and, you know, go on some crazy crime spree and start doing all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't do even if I believed God. Right. But that I think that's why it's so difficult, because they have a sense of this. But, you know, going back to this, there's no way to consistently make sense of that, Right. Because if it's just my in, like inbuilt opinion about good, bad, right, wrong, like. Can we get everybody to agree about that? Can we get like moral consensus on things as a society? No, not even that. So like that's one thing to think about too. Any other thoughts before we close this chapter out? Just Questions? Um, uh, when I was going over J.L. Mackey in philosophy class, I, I, I don't know, this sounds really stupid, but um god is not they say god is not all powerful because he cannot control free will mm -hmm. like i just want to like like kind of how to get around that it, it sounds stupid to me but it's just like well can all well, i think when we say all powerful we mean things that fall into the realm of logically possible right, right. so if you have free will then you can't logically force someone to freely do something all oh, right, because it's logically right. impossible. So, so, but God has the power to create people with free will, which is that's a that's a tough one because, like, that's where even a lot of Christians struggle. Like, how how is it possible that I could have free will? Because there must be some reason why I did what I did. You know, they, they, there's cause and effect built in. It has to be that way, and it's hard to explain how I could just do something, and it wasn't caused, right? So ultimately, God has the power to give free will. But he doesn't have the power to override free will because that would be logically impossible. Yeah, now he knows what you would do, and I think God can can kind of put you in situations where you'll do what he wants you to do because he knows that you would freely do that. But that's not that's not a trick or anything, right. right? I think the key to it is like if so God has the power to create free will and he has the power theoretically to take it away. So he gave us giving us free will was a choice for him and he decided he wanted us to have free will so then he gave a he made a choice to give up that control over our free will and he has the choice theoretically to take it back right because he could decide that he doesn't want us to have free will anymore and he could just say no no more free will right i, I would say more that he'll he'll lock you into your choice right yeah Work. Like so, the, like theoretically, he has the power to to make us do things. Like he gave us free will, but he also has because because he created it, he has the power to take it away, right? Uh, show you, right? You think it has to take you? Yeah. Like, yeah, in some regards, but I think as long as you're functioning normally, right? You have that. Right? But I think that's the key, though, is like, if he has the power to create it, then it was a choice for him to give it to us. So he still, like, in that sense, has the power. Right? All right, let's ask you that <laughs> next time. Okay. Next, next week. Okay. Let's break the questions.
Lord, thank you for this time. We think about these things. Thank you for your word. Thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus and the salvation that we can have through him. Thank you for this food now. Pray you bless our bodies and our time of fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.